investigated three separate atrocities in Bucha. Widespread, indiscriminate murder being carried out by the Russian army. The UN is investigating reports of sexual violence by Russian forces in Bucha and in other cities across Ukraine. We've seen other Russian soldiers being killed by Ukrainian forces. As George Washington once said, it's time for this month's COVID-19 update. The podium positions have still remained unchanged, however the nations of France and Germany have managed to sneak their way into the top five. We at the Swag News team would like to congratulate these nations for their accomplishments. The biggest COVID-19 story in April were the lockdowns seen within China. As we all know, COVID-19 started when a Chinese guy got sick after eating a Pokemon leading to pretty harsh lockdowns to quell the virus within the country. As it stands, China has spent a large portion of the pandemic without such measures. However this all changed in March when an outbreak in the east of the nation started spreading to other cities. Since the pandemic started, China has gained a reputation for having the strictest lockdown policies in the world and within the city of Shanghai especially, things were about to get a whole lot stricter. The government would go beyond the standard mask mandates and bans on indoor gatherings and would start to evacuate entire apartment buildings to make way for temporary housing for COVID patients. The restrictions also limited the amount of time citizens could leave their homes and shutdowns on all non-essential industries would quickly lead to a food shortage. Rations would later be sent out to citizens under lockdown. But as you can imagine, in a city with a population comparable with Australia, there wasn't always enough to go around. Disgruntled citizens who opposed the incredibly strict zero covid policy would start protests in the empty streets, and one man became famous after he used his drone to fish in a nearby pond. In some areas, citizens began looting from supermarkets, screaming from their apartments, or in some cases, requesting for police to arrest them outright so they'd have something to eat. There was even a claim by one American talk show host that citizens were throwing themselves from balconies to avoid starvation, however we couldn't find any such evidence of this occurring. In the first week of these lockdowns, the city recorded 17 deaths from COVID-19, most of which were unvaccinated, elderly, and had underlying health conditions. Whether these stats are correct, and whether anyone died from lockdown-related problems, we might never know. The nation of France held its national election this month, and as the country has the second biggest economy in Europe, we figured it would be a fun event to cover. French elections in particular are interesting affairs, as they have a very unique way of choosing who should run the country. Firstly, pretty much anyone can throw their name into the ring and run for president, as the only requirements are to be a French citizen and be over the age of 18. Candidates are then required to gather 500 signatures from national or local officials across the country. From here, the first round of voting begins, with any candidate getting over 50% of the vote, immediately getting the top job, however, this has never happened. From here, the top two candidates move on to round two, and whoever gets the most votes, wins the election. In many ways, the French system is very similar to the United States, as unlike many of its European counterparts, 
the French president tends to wield a lot more direct power. Another thing the two nations had in common, up until the early 60s, was an electoral college system, where instead of voting for candidates directly, you'd instead be voting on behalf of your state. Electoral college systems have been adopted by a handful of nations around the world, but they can sometimes lead to some pretty wacky side effects. In the United States, a vote can be weighted very differently depending on where the voter lives, which for example, means a resident in Wyoming has roughly 3.6 times the voting power when compared to a person in California. What this means is that the candidate with the most votes doesn't always win, which has happened five times throughout the nation's history, two of which occurring since the year 2000. In 1962, the French thought their electoral college was unnecessary, so they voted to get rid of it completely, which is why the current system is all about racking up those popular votes. In terms of the candidates themselves, the first round came down to three main contenders. The first is Emmanuel Macron, who was elected in 2017, becoming the youngest French head of state since Napoleon. Macron has been widely considered a centrist within France and would initially run on a platform of reducing unemployment, strengthening labor laws, and cutting corporate tax. Since being elected, Macron has scrapped the nation's wealth tax, given out 300 euro culture vouchers for all 18 year olds who apply, and has long been committed to strengthening the European Union. Mr. Macron has sometimes been accused of being snobbish by people within France and accused of being French by those internationally. The next candidate is Marine Le Pen, who is the leader of the National Rally Party, a faction which has been considered far-right within France. Le Pen has advocated for a zero-tolerance law and order policy, even going as far as wanting to reinstate capital punishment within the country. The party has also called for a harsher stance on immigration particularly from regions within Africa and the Middle East, and has planned to roll back a law that gives people born on French soil citizenship by default. In terms of foreign policy, Marine Le Pen has generally been skeptical of being too heavily involved in both NATO and the European Union. She has also been historically quite fond of Vladimir Putin, calling him quote, a defender of the Christian heritage of European civilization. Economically, the party has had a softer approach, with Le Pen supporting government control of health, education, transportation, banking, and energy. In what might be surprising, Le Pen has actually picked up a lot of support among younger voters, going as far as to propose free public transport in off hours, and even proposing to abolish income tax to citizens under 30. The third main candidate was Jean-Luc Mélenchon, of the La France Insoumise party, a faction considered far left within the nation. Mélenchon has been particularly skeptical of the European Union, and has advocated for France to leave NATO entirely. He has also been in favor of strengthening labor rights, and the expansion of French welfare programs, as well as a mass redistribution of wealth. This guy isn't fucking around either, as he's called for a 100% tax on all earnings, above 360,000 euros per year. The socialist candidate has also advocated for free health care across the board, the easing of immigration laws, and for the president to have less overall power within France. During the first round of voting, Emmanuel Macron won, with over 27% of the vote, leaving his more radical counterparts at a close 23% for Marine Le Pen and 22% for Jean-Luc Mélenchon, eliminating him from the race. Shortly after the first round had concluded, it was reported that the European Union's anti-fraud body was investigating Marine Le Pen for allegedly embezzling around 620,000 euros. Le Pen's lawyer responded by questioning the timing of these reports. However, Le Pen herself has been under investigation since 2018 for allegations of breach of trust and the misuse of public funds. This revelation didn't go on to do her any favors in the second round of voting, as Emmanuel Macron would go on to win a second term with 58.6% of the vote. This victory makes Macron unique in that not only did he win as an independent and go on to become one of the youngest French leaders of all time, but he's also the first re-elected French president in the past 20 years. With the voting concluded, the Le Pen family have lost a combined total of eight French elections. 
in what seems to be something ripped straight out of the madness of 2020. Elon Musk has purchased Twitter. At the start of the month, Mr. Musk revealed that he'd purchased a 9.2% stake in the social media giant before announcing he would be joining the company's board of directors. The eccentric billionaire mentioned that he had several suggestions for the company, including the addition of long-requested edit button and to transform its Los Angeles office into a homeless shelter. Later that day, Musk would execute a bamboozle operation, instead making it known that he intended a complete takeover of the company. On the 14th of April, elongated musket, filed documents with the Securities and Exchange Commission to buy the company outright at just over $54 a share for a grand total of $43 billion. In the world of business, a public company which trades on the stock market is usually obligated to make certain decisions to maximize its own earning potential. With this in mind, when someone like Elon Musk buys all the shares, he then becomes the sole owner, meaning he alone has control over any and all decisions made by the company. If he wanted to flip the logo upside down, turn the whole site lime green, or dissolve the company entirely, he'd be well within his rights to do so. Quite unsurprisingly, most commentators speculated that his talk of outright buying the company was just Musk having a laugh, as he had previously joked about taking Tesla private for $420 a share. He would later be fined for artificially inflating the stock price. In the face of this takeover, the board of directors weren't exactly thrilled at the idea of someone buying the entire company essentially overnight. So they attempted to use what's called a poison pill strategy to stop Mr. Musk from gaining majority ownership. For the uninitiated, a poison pill strategy means that Twitter would give existing shareholders the right to buy additional shares at a discounted rate, essentially diluting the ownership stake of the majority shareholder. This defense didn't last long however, as after Musk provided financial backing, showing that he could indeed afford the purchase, the board of directors accepted his offer in an almost anticlimactic fashion. Where things go from here is anyone's guess. Elon Musk has openly criticized the way the company had been run for a while, so it's likely that top-level leadership may soon be looking for a new place to work. Musk has long been a free speech advocate and has described Twitter as something of an online town square where people shouldn't be subject to censorship. The entire free speech debate among social media platforms has picked up some serious traction in the last few years, with some arguing that any limits on free speech shouldn't be tolerated, as any limitations lead to a slippery slope of censorship. Others have argued that without such limits, Social media platforms tend to become a place where misinformation is allowed to thrive. According to a study released by the American Journal of Topical Medicine and Hygiene, over 5,800 Americans were admitted to hospital after reading bullshit COVID-19 advice online, and between May and September 2018, there were 18 killings in India, which were directly attributed to misinformation. There are also the implications of being able to undermine the foundations of democracy and arguments for and against absolute free speech in this sense, but that might be a discussion for another time. Whatever happens, there are some serious implications for turning this free speech needle, even slightly one way or the other, and I for one, don't envy anyone who has to make such a decision. With the amount of money Elon paid for Twitter, a person could buy 20 Hubble telescopes, house the entire homeless population of Los Angeles for 121 years, or on the US military, for nearly 23 days. On the 22nd of April, at around 6.30pm, a 50-year-old man by the name of Wynne Bruce would climb the steps of the Supreme Court building in Washington DC, sit down, and set himself on fire. Mr. Bruce would then be airlifted to a local hospital, but would later die of his injuries. When Bruce didn't appear to say anything before he died, but by looking back on his online activity, the man had been a climate activist and a practicing Buddhist. Buddhists have long had a history of self-immolation as a form of protest, with as many as 100 monks lighting themselves on fire to protest the Vietnam War. In recent years however, it seems as if climate activists have taken up the act as a similar form of protest. 
In 2018, an American man by the name of David Buckle set himself on fire, stating before his death quote, most humans on the planet now breathe air, made unhealthy by fossil fuels, and many die early deaths as a result. My early death by fossil fuel reflects what we are doing to ourselves. When Bruce however, didn't write any such letter to the press, but made an ambiguous comment on a link he posted in 2020, which seemed to cryptically describe the date of his death and how he would die. Clicking the link leads to an online course about the science and impact of climate change by an educational institution founded by Harvard and MIT. Only a small handful of articles covering the event mentioned the motives of why when Bruce would set himself on fire in front of the Supreme Court. This kind of reporting may lead viewers to believe that even when people take such drastic actions for the concern of the entire world, news outlets are still inclined to brush over these details for their own corporate convenience. With this in mind, viewers who want to overcome their own firewalls might be interested in today's sponsor. If you have a reason for wanting to appear somewhere else, or just want to watch Peaky Blinders slightly early, then you'll probably want a VPN. Surfshark VPN makes protecting your online privacy and watching prohibited Netflix shows more simple than the average logo for a tech company, and you can rest easy knowing that your privacy will be infinitely more secure than the Sudanese government. Gone are the days of having to raise the Jolly Roger every time you wanted to watch a slightly obscure show from another country. Simply change your location to anywhere you like and appreciate a whole cornucopia of new media to enjoy. Signing up with the code on screen will give viewers an 83% discount, 3 months for free, and viewers who aren't 100% satisfied can back out in the first 30 days and get a full refund. Surfshark VPN. It's cheaper than the other ones. Meanwhile, the Australian Prime Minister tells struggling renters to just buy houses. A man who paid 2.9 million for an NFT loses 2.9 million. And Joe Biden thinks America as a nation can be defined in a single word. I was gonna put him in, uh, foot, foot. The Prime Minister of Pakistan has been voted out of office this month, making him the first in the nation's history. Former cricket star Imran Khan was voted into the position in 2018 and maintained a steady approval rating throughout his term, but his time in office was ended following a vote of no confidence by members of the National Assembly. Viewers might recognize this political move as the same one used by Padme to give Senator Palpatine the position of Supreme Chancellor in the Galactic Senate, but most of the time, these votes aren't nearly as interesting. All it really means is that if more than half the National Assembly thinks that the current leader is unfit to hold office for one reason or another, they can choose to vote them out and install someone else in their place. In the case of Imran Khan, his opposition cited poor economic and social indicators during his four years in office, which were made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. Essentially, he was accused of doing fuck all to improve the lives of those within his country, and as a former professional cricket player, doing fuck all would very much be within his skill set. In all seriousness, the sequence of events leading up to his ousting was quite eventful to say the least. Prime Minister Khan would initially dissolve parliament completely in order to stop the vote from going forward, a move that the nation's Supreme Court would quickly reverse, citing its unconstitutional nature. Mr Khan would then be voted from office with the 174 votes necessary for a simple majority. The next day, Sheba Sharif would be voted into office entirely unopposed after Imran Khan's party staged a mass walkout in protest. The now former prime minister would heavily criticize the vote of no confidence and has accused the new government of being part of a US-backed conspiracy. According to Mr. Khan, the United States was unhappy with his refusal to build a military base within Pakistan and also with his seemingly close relationship with Vladimir Putin. In fact, Imran Khan was visiting Mr. Putin in Moscow on the first day of the Ukrainian invasion, much to the condemnation of European diplomats. The United States has officially denied allegations of foreign interference. Whatever the case, radars opposing the vote of no confidence cropped up around the country, with the largest taking place in the city of Karachi, attracting an estimated 20,000 people. 
the new Prime Minister, Shebar Sharif, has also been criticized on his own merits, as only a year ago, he was released from prison on bail, after being charged with laundering the equivalent of 41 million US dollars. As it stands, the political future of the nation is almost destined to be turbulent, and to this day, no Pakistani Prime Minister has ever served a full term in office. In a surprise announcement, the nation of Denmark may soon start phasing out sales of cigarettes. The move comes after the nation's health minister proposed a ban on the sale of all tobacco within the country to citizens born after the year 2010. What this means is that citizens who are currently around 12 and under will be banned from ever buying cigarettes in their lifetime, which in theory would allow the nation to slowly phase out its use completely. The health minister stated that smoking is the leading cause of cancer within the Nordic country, responsible for 13,600 deaths a year, and according to a recent survey, 64% of Danish residents would be in favor of the ban. The news comes after New Zealand officially put a similar law into motion in December of last year, which sparked a series of questions around its effectiveness. When the war on drugs was waged by the United States as part of its Cold War DLC, drugs ended up as the undisputed champion, leading many to believe that prohibiting these kinds of vices will only lead to a flourishing black market. This was actually something that the New Zealand government addressed at the time, stating that its border security efforts would need to be expanded, as the ban could make the nation a target for foreign smugglers. With this in mind, New Zealand as a country already had favorable conditions for such a ban, with its youth smoking rate already being comparatively quite low, and its geography making it much easier to stop smuggling operations in their tracks. New Zealand itself also has a reputation of passing laws that later become adopted in other countries, with the nation becoming the first in the world to let women vote in 1893 and the first country in Oceania to approve same-sex marriage in 2013. Measuring the effects of these bans will likely take decades before we actually know whether they work, so perhaps viewers watching 20 years from now can comment below and let us know if these bans were a success. As it stands, smoking has become gradually less cool for youth around the world, however, it will be interesting to see whether banning the practice completely could see these plans eventually backfire. We now once again come to the Ukrainian invasion, which we'll start by looking at what's changed on the ground. In the north, Ukrainian counter-attacks have managed to remove the majority of Russian presence from the region, forcing them to the Belarusian border or into western Russia. As it stands, the capital of Kiev is relatively safe. In the south however, Russia has remained far more successful, making the most of its rapid gains in the first weeks of the invasion. This momentum has however, been significantly slowed by strong resistance from the cities of Mykolaiv in the west and Mariupol in the east. Mariupol itself has been fully encircled since the start of March, and as of time of writing at the end of April, the city is now mostly under control of Russian forces. According to the local mayor, the shelling of the city has led to at least 20,000 civilians dead, although this cannot be confirmed due to the fog of war. The east of the country now appears to be the focus of the invasion, where in the Donbass region, Russian-backed separatists had already controlled a significant amount of territory pre-invasion. Whether this is a tactical massing of forces, or whether Russia underestimated its capabilities in the north, still remains to be seen. For the third month in a row, the story of Snake Island continues to unfold, and if this shit doesn't end up in Ukrainian folklore, for generations to come, then they are doing themselves a disservice. The island became famous in the first few days of the invasion, when its 13 Ukrainian guardsmen were ordered to surrender by the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, a vessel named Moskva. The guardsmen would then reply with the now famous line, Russian warship, go fuck yourself, before later being captured, then subsequently returned home in a prisoner exchange at the end of March. This story would become even more interesting in the middle of April, when it would be reported that the Moskva had been sunk. According to reports, the vessel was evacuated after it was hit by an anti-ship missile, which would lead to the ship becoming unseaworthy. Supposedly, the ship officially sank while it was being towed to a friendly port, 
however, it would then sustain heavy damage after losing balance, causing its store of ammunition to explode. As expected, the reports from both Russia and Ukraine would cover the incident differently. According to Russian state media, the ship did indeed sink, however, it was merely the cause of a fire, with no attack being mentioned. Ukrainian media on the other hand, reported that not only was the ship hit by a Ukrainian missile, but the explosion also killed the ship's captain, a claim we weren't able to verify. One man who didn't believe the official Russian reports was Vladimir Bortko, a Russian film director and former politician, who was rightfully convinced that the sinking of the Moskva was the result of a Ukrainian attack. He would then go on to make himself look like an absolute dumbass by insisting that Russia should go to war with Ukraine over the incident and that Russia's trademarked special military operation that definitely isn't a war doesn't go far enough. In all honesty, the sinking of the Moskva is more of a symbolic defeat than a tactical setback. The vessel was the flagship of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, it housed a crew of over 500 and it now stands as the nation's biggest warship to be sunk in action since the Second World War. The ship was however critical to support others within its fleet, and it was the only ship in the region with long-range anti-air defenses on board. Although the Moskva is now by far the biggest ship sunk during the invasion, we'd be lying if we said that the war at sea wasn't very much in Russia's favor. On the water, Russia has seen two of its ships taken out completely and two more damaged. On the other hand, Ukraine has had eight unidentified ships sunk, one patrol boat taken down, five boats captured, its command ship damaged, and the nation's flagship scuttled to not fall into enemy hands. A part of the invasion which has only recently come to light are so-called filtration camps, where Russian forces will process Ukrainian civilians before figuring out what to do with them. Thousands of civilians have flocked to these camps, as in many cases, it's their only way of evacuating without the risk of trying to cross the border. Ukrainians who have been through these camps say that photos are taken of them from all sides, their fingerprints are recorded, and they are then interrogated for hours while being processed. Before arriving at these camps, people usually clear out their phone of anything that might be considered in support of Ukraine, as these are also checked upon arrival. According to a couple interviewed, if the interrogators suspected that a person had Nazi ties, they could then be taken to be tortured or executed, although this couldn't be verified independently. In any case, this proves that the Nazi-based excuse of invading seems to be believed by Russians on the ground, even as we've previously covered, the rate of neo-Nazi activity is almost identical within Russia and Ukraine. Within the camps, the conditions were described to be horrific. Elderly people slept on the floor without mattresses, thousands of people had to share the same toilet and sink, and soap and disinfectant were entirely absent. Evacuation buses to the west of Ukraine were said to be extremely inconsistent, but on the other hand, transport offered into Russia was freely available, and some within the camps were even forced onto the Russian-bound coaches. It was said that the elderly and disabled were usually allowed to leave quickly as they weren't perceived to be as much of a risk, however, young people detained could expect to stay much longer. Alternatively, others were able to escape with the help of local drivers who were able to map out routes across the country using dirt roads, fields, and narrow pathways. Some of these drivers needed to get around as many as 12 checkpoints before making it out safely. As it stands, 11 million Ukrainians have been displaced by the conflict. One dimension of the war we've yet to cover is the sheer amount of war crimes that have been committed since the start of this relatively infant conflict. On the second day of the invasion, Amnesty International had already reported that Russian troops were using cluster missiles, which have been heavily criticized for being absurdly indiscriminate weapons. To put it into perspective, historically 98% of cluster missile casualties are civilians, with 27% of those being children. It's hard to even comprehend a weapon system that could be more statistically indiscriminate if you tried. One of the most famous war crimes of the conflict is the Bucha massacre, which was only brought to light at the start of April. 
the city of Bucha was captured by Russian forces on the 12th of March, only to be recaptured by the end of the same month, but upon returning, Ukrainian forces found 500 bodies within the area, many of which were civilians who had their hands tied, before being shot in the back of the head. A further investigation found a basement being used as a torture chamber, bodies mutilated and burned, and corpses being booby-trapped to be found later. By the 9th of April, Ukrainian forensic investigators began recovering bodies from mass graves. The fact that this happened isn't even in dispute, with drone footage, satellite analysis, and eyewitnesses, all piecing together the short but brutal occupation of the city, and in talking to The Economist, one eyewitness even pretended to be dead, to escape capture. To say that these war criminals were caught in 4K would be a blatant understatement. As could be expected, Russia has officially denied responsibility for the massacre, and instead claimed that the entire event was staged by Ukrainian forces to make Russia look bad. Like we've been saying, since the start of this conflict, these kinds of responses aren't aimed at the wider world, and are more so directed at Russian citizens themselves, who don't have the free access of information to easily discredit these claims. One aspect that might be overlooked during such a conflict is the scale of sexual violence being committed across the country. Many of the victims of these crimes are unfortunately killed as a result, and there's been evidence that some have been witnessed by young children. Some outlets have stated that children as young as 11 have also been victim to this same treatment. However, by following only rock-solid sources, the youngest we could find was a case in Bucha involving a 14-year-old girl. This doesn't mean that Ukraine has been entirely free of criminal activity, and this mostly has to do with its treatment of prisoners. Viewers might remember videos of Russian soldiers we showed last month, who vented their rage after discovering that the reason for invading was all predicated on a lie. As it turns out, filming these prisoners is actually against Article 13 of the Geneva Convention, which shields prisoners from quote, insults and public curiosity. Other incidents have been far more serious, including a video uploaded at the end of March, which appears to show Ukrainian soldiers shoot Russian prisoners in the kneecaps. This incident is being investigated by both Ukrainian and Russian officials, however, Ukraine's armed forces chief would later claim that Russia had been staging videos in order to discredit Ukrainian defense forces. In all honesty, we have no idea what happened in this incident. On the other hand, a video of a Georgian volunteer executing Russian soldiers seemed to be far more legitimate, and to our knowledge, no party has disputed the validity of the video. Other crimes include unconfirmed deployment of chemical weapons, the deportation of around 700,000 Ukrainian civilians, general looting, the apparent use of children as human shields, and the destruction of cultural landmarks. In all honesty, these are just a handful of the instances of war crimes which have been committed up until now, and I suspect we could probably make an entire video dedicated to individual accounts if it wasn't so overwhelmingly depressing. With the news over, let's get down to business. Last month, to celebrate everyone's longtime Patreon commitment, we gave you Degenerate Fucks the opportunity to vote for any video idea in the whole wide world. Some of the ideas were actually pretty good, like making us swap roles for a video, forcing our interns to fight to the death, or calculating the kinetic power of Will Smith's slap. As it turns out, the top three were as unique as they were difficult. Number three was to make a video explaining the in-depth lore of Five Nights at Freddy's, which sounds like the hardest thing we would have had to make since the Israel and Palestine video in the middle of last year. Second place was to make a hentai tier list, which literally had the team discussing how the fuck we'd measure each metric, like a round table of Nobel Prize winners. In all likelihood, we would have had to ask viewers to watch hentai on our behalf as a way to crowdsource the data, but as it turns out, this suggestion was overtaken around a week into the voting process, much to the relief of the rest of the team. The winner however, was a real life bullshit olympics among members of the team, where we'd compete to become the ultimate bullshit champion. Truth be told, out of every single option you motherfuckers could have chosen, this one is by far the most difficult. This might come as a surprise, but the team is spread out over four different continents, and none of us have ever actually spoken face to face. With this in mind, 
To fulfill this very lofty request, we are going to need a lot more time, a metric shit ton of brainstorming, and quite likely a very friendly chat with Raid Shadow Legends. God forgive us for our sins. Viewers who want to support what we do, and watch a bunch of exclusive content, can do so in the description. Supporters help the channel more than most might realize, because when YouTube doesn't even like creators saying offensive words, you can imagine they're not too happy when we talk about war crimes. Furthermore, if you want to follow either myself or other members of the team, links to our Twitter profiles will also be listed below. Once again, on behalf of the entire team, we'd like to wish all viewers a happy May of 2022.